glad so many of you are here today. Um, my name is Lois Ahrens. I'm the director of the Real Cost of Prisons Project, and I'm one of the organizers of this event, uh, along with Jeff Napolitano, hiding behind the pillar from the AFSC, and Elisa Klein, our Ward 7 City Councilor, who's over there. And um, Can people hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, on, maybe some of you are here actually. Um, on November 26, 2014, uh, I stood on this same spot following the news that once again there would be impunity for a policeman, and that policeman was Darren Wilson who was not charged with the execution style murder of Michael Brown. Uh, since then, Tanisha Anderson, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, and hundreds of others, hundreds of others, African American men and women have been killed at the hands of the police. Um, this year, just this year, 132 African American men and six women were killed by the police, including last weekend Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. So we've come to know all of these names, and sometimes there's so many names that we can't even keep track of who they all are. In November uh, 2014, I asked for four and a half minutes of silence to honor Michael Brown, who laid in the street for four and a half hours, I'm sure people remember this, after he was killed. Today, I think, and I hope you think too, that there's been enough silence, that we don't need more minutes of silence. We need outrage. We need outrage, we need anger, we need outrage. And we need outrage and noise to honor Alton and Philando. So what I'm saying is, stand up. Please say it, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Speak out. Speak out. Enough. Enough. Stand up. Stand up. Speak out. Speak out! Enough! Enough! My friend Zion is going to take over. <laughs> Stand up! Speak out! Enough! 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 Stand up. Stand if there is any theme for today, I hope that that theme is stand up and do something. Don't be silent. Do not be silent. The time for silence is over. We've had enough. Enough killing and no, no, no killing in our name. No more killing in our name. The first person is Andrew Grant Thomas, who is a dad to Lola and Lena, a partner to Melissa, a son, a friend, a longtime racial justice guy, sounds good, a black man of Jamaican origins in the, Uni of the United States, born on the 4th of July. Oh Knowing what he knows, and giving the examples of people everywhere he looks doing heroic work to push back against injustice, racial and otherwise, he thinks it would be obscene for him to not lend his efforts to this struggle. So here's Andrew. I take standing up, standing up for black lives seriously, and so when Elisa issued the invitation for me to come and speak, I thought, what can I possibly say okay. 
that would be, in my opinion, useful to you. And here's, here's the one thing I want to say. In my experience and belief, Jody Casper, the police chief here in Northampton, is someone you can work with. I say this as someone who's been doing this work, including work on policing, police brutality, for 25 years and more, wearing a whole range of hats. I say this as someone who is more cynical than most, with good reason. I say this as someone who met Chief Casper in a Healing Racism Institute workshop not long ago, where she was the first person from the department to go because she wanted to learn, and where she proved to the rest of us that she actually already knew quite a bit. I say this as someone who interviewed her two days ago, right, having made the arrangement to do that long before last week's events. I say this too as someone who's not a Northampton resident, right, I live in Amherst. I can't say that I know her well. I think many of you will have information that I don't have. I say this as someone who's been wrong before. And I hope I'm not wrong about this. But among the many things I asked her about, and the interview uh, will come out, you know, my wife and I run something called Embrace Race. I see a few friends here who are involved in it. It's about helping parents and teachers, caregivers to young kids, figure out how to help those kids negotiate race today. And so we're gonna publish that, publish the Chief's reflections on what's been happening. And one of the things I asked her, she has a 12-year-old son, a white son, and I asked her if she spoke about what's going on to her son, and she said yes. And I said, you know, if you had a 12-year-old black son or a brown son, a child of color, would you have something somewhat different to say to your child? And she said, yeah, I would. That's the reality. I would absolutely have something different to say to my child. When, you know, my, as, as uh, was mentioned, I have two girls, eight and five, and, you know, when I was 25, when I was 30, I thought that social change was going to come, and a lot of us were saying this, long after we were dead, right? We we're working for 100 years from now. That's not how I think about it anymore, right? I'm working for me. <laughs> I'm working for you and for our kids. And I'm working for 10 years from now. Here's the challenge I want you to take to Chief Casper. In 10 years, not 30, not 100, in 10 years, when my oldest daughter graduates from high school, imagine that we're telling a very different story and having very different gatherings right, around the police and around race. We have a different story to tell. And whatever the story is in Northampton, it is a better story than the one we're telling now. How did we get there? Think about how, how did we get there and sit down with Chief Casper. And if there's any way that I can help, I would love to do that. Sit down with Chief Casper and figure out how we're going to implement those things that we need to get there. Because we can't, it cannot be the case that we keep having to meet like this on occasions like this. Good luck. Our next speaker is Romina Arisbel Pacheco, my right, was born in, uh, who was born and raised in the Caribbean city of Maracay, Venezuela, and migrated to the United States in her early 20s. 
She has a master's degree in social justice education from UMass, from UMass, and a PhD in curriculum instruction from New Mexico State University. She currently lives with her family here in Northampton and works for the Resident Life Department at Smith College. Please, rec please welcome Romina. Thank you. So I grew up in Venezuela, in a neighborhood where my mom had to hear comments such as, tus hijos son negritos pero educados. Your kids are black but well behaved. As if, you know, they were compliments. There could not be a bigger insult to a mother, to the mother of two black children, than telling her that her kids are meant to be bad but because of their blackness, but for some reason, they were the exception. You see, the white supremacy system that suffocates us is not just something that affects the United States. Neither it is something that just attacks black men. This is also a system that attacks black women, Latinx people, indigenous people, trans and queer people of color, people with disabilities here and around the globe. And don't be fooled. This is not an issue of other places. This is happening, happening in our own backyard. The Pioneer Valley is not any better than Louisiana or Minnesota. Why are we so segregated? Have you ever questioned that? Take a look at Northampton, take a look at Holyoke, take a look at Springfield. Why are we so segregated? After I spoke last, the last time about my experience with police harassment in this area, I had a dear friend ask me why I, did I choose to come back after being away for seven years knowing that it could happen again. There's a simple answer to that. There's no safe heaven for black people in this country. There might be some places that are less toxic than others, but the truth is that racism reigns everywhere in this country, and anti-black sentiment permeates most places around the world. Racism in Northampton may be less visible to you than it is in other places in the South, for example, but trust me, it is here. We are dying in the hands of an oppressive system that was designed to keep us down. Some are dying in an instant due to gunshots, but most of us are dying slowly. Racism kills, plain and simple. There is a reason why black women in the United States are more likely to have miscarriages, premature and underweight babies. It is because of the burden of racism that we carry in our bodies. Black Lives Matter stands for more than speaking against police brutality. It stands for dignity, respect, and justice. Black Lives Matter... <laughs> ...is an affirmation of the resilience of black folks in all of our magic. It is also an affirmation of the lives of black, queer, and trans folks, people with disabilities, black and documented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum. I am here to tell you that I see you and that I, I affirm your life. I'm telling, I'm telling everybody else, especially white people, we are here and we're not going anywhere. So you better join us in our liberation because we know that black liberation is liberation for all. If you have any doubt, check out the Haitian Revolution that influenced anti-colonial movements and emancipation of slavery in the whole region. When we liberate ourselves, we liberate others. White people, listen up white people. If you are wondering how you can support black lives, start by building genuine relationships with us. Pay close attention and make the choice to question racism. If you are a white parent of a white child, speak to your kid about race and racism. I've been doing it with my child practically since day one. She has had no other choice but to witness her dad being racially profiled. She has had no other choice but to fear the anti-immigrant rhetoric because she knows she comes from a family of immigrants. She has had no other choice but to notice that oftentimes there are not many of us around. Go ahead, take that bold step because protecting your child from the painful reality that is racism puts my child in danger. Again, 
question why? Why do we live in such a segregated area? That uh, support people of color lead organizations demand that schools include people of color in the full expression in the curriculum. It is not enough to reduce us to the I have a dream speech. There is more, much, much more to us than that. <laughs> to mis queridos Latinx familia, let's read ourselves of anti-black sentiment and pay attention because we are also being persecuted. Many of us are black too, as you can see. To my black family here and everywhere around the world, I could not be more proud to belong to such a fine group of people. We are gold. We need to engage in a vision of freedom and liberation that goes beyond demanding that police officers wear body cameras. Our liberation is more complex and beautiful than that. Let's join together in that vision. Fear at times can be paralyzing. I know that firsthand. I've experienced it in my own skin. But there is a difference between having the choice to be brave and just being put in a position where you have no other choice but to be brave. I read a comment the other day on Facebook that said that Philando Castile's girlfriend was brave to film the killing of her boyfriend. And I agree, but I don't think she had any other choice. Having the choice to be brave is a privilege. Those who have that privilege, you said. When faith. When faced with the choice to be brave or to be paralyzed in the face of racism, always choose to be brave, because you know there are others who simply do not have that choice. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zion Barber. He's the president of Students of Color in, at Northampton High School. He's 16 years old. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I would first like to start off by giving a shout out to my friend Alana Williams, who like helped me with this. Without her, I would not know what I know today. I would not care about what I care about today, and I would not love myself the way I love myself today. I thank her for that. <laughs> and now, I would like to thank you all for gathering here to honor the lives of Owen Sterling and Philando Castile, along with the thousands, if not millions, who have also been plagued by this racially fueled police brutality epidemic. It seems as if police are in constant fear of black people, while white people who are clearly committing crimes are treated with more leniency. That is because media and deeply ingrained racism paint black people as idiotic savages due to crime being so prominent in black communities, instead of what we really are people just trying to survive in a system that has ignored us for so long. <laughs> but it's simple economics. If, if the system isn't putting enough money into these inner cities, then these kids have to figure out ways to make money that work around the system. This is an important topic because when Owen Sterling, dad, when Owen Sterling died, what was the first thing people brought up? His criminal history. Their past criminal history was what agents of oppression used to justify his current, unrelated, cold-blooded murder. It is, <laughs> it is important we realize the cycle of crime and poverty that people of color were and are forced into in order to actively break said cycle and to stop giving cops the I fear for my life excuse when there was obviously no danger present. Right. <laughs> uh, Inner cities, which are mostly black neighborhoods due to segregation in the 60s, which forced black people into those communities due to fear of black and white mixing, are usually very underfunded. School systems are weak, and even if a kid gets straight A's throughout his whole school career, he still gets denied by colleges due to the location of the school. So many children do not have the resources to really make it out of the hood, uh, which leads people to a life of crime. Imagine if your people were forced into communities and given no support for over 100 years. Then obviously it will have a huge impact on your community. That is what is currently happening to black people in America. A lot of us have no other way out. We either have to work two jobs and barely get by or sell drugs and eat well for us and our family. Steal or starve. And do those sound like choices to you? Of course not. Of course not. Survival isn't a choice, nor should it be political. 
uh, we don't receive education required to learn how to build our community back up. And the donation money only goes so far when there isn't systematic change to make sure that that money is putting, getting put back into our community. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so basically we're stuck. We're stuck. We really are. We often have to live in a separate underground economy that has to disobey the system that ignores it in order to survive. We can't let this cycle prevail or else we could, and by looking at the way things are, will lose many more. So we need to open up this dialogue. We need to force change. We need to help our people of color. We have to work together. Because as long as our brothers are forced into a life of crime, the government will continue to justify our genocide. I am not a thug because of the color of my skin, and a person of color is not a bad person because they have a criminal history. Rest in peace to those who have fallen, and remember the ones in front of the gun lives forever in the memories and the melodies of the people. Thank you. Lisa Klein is going to have to follow that. <clears throat> um, Lisa Klein is serving her second term as a city councilor in Northampton. Uh, when she spoke at here on the city hall steps in November of 2014 after the Ferguson grand jury didn't indict uh, Daryl Wilson for Michael Brown's uh, murder, some of you may remember, I do, that she came under attack by the local police union and others for speaking out as an elected official. But thankfully, she is reelected, and she is back here again today to continue to say no to systematic and institutional racism and do what she feels is her civic duty as an elected official. So thank you, Elisa. Welcome, Northampton. There's a lot of people here. There's a lot. Um, welcome to all of you who are from Northampton. Shout out if you're from Northampton. From other cities in western Massachusetts. Other parts of Massachusetts besides Western Massachusetts? Other parts of the country? Okay. Um, I'm honored to be on the steps of City Hall here with these articulate and talented um, activists and scholars. Thank you for your words and commitment to all of you that have spoken and that are about to speak. And to all of you who came here today to say no to the extinguishment of black lives. The last time we gathered here for a similar rally was November 24th, 2014, the day after the Ferguson Grand Jury's non-indictment of Daryl Wilson, uh, the police officer who shot Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black man. By my calculations, that was 595 days ago, that's 14,280 hours ago, and in that span of just 14,000 hours, According to the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement Report, Operation Ghetto Storm, 510 unarmed black people have been killed by law enforcement, security guards, and vigilantes in this country. Over the last year and a half, almost one million black men and women were incarcerated. In their lifetimes, one in every three, almost one in every two, almost one in every two black men are going to be incarcerated in their lifetimes. This is the extinguishment of black lives that I'm talking about. The New York Times calls it disappearance of black men. More than one out of every six black men who today should be 25 and fit, uh, between 25 and 54 years old have disappeared from daily life. That's from the New York Times. For instance, in Ferguson, Missouri, as an example, there are 60 men for every 100 black women in this age group. And it's due to early death, and it's due to being behind bars, and it's due to racism. 
If you're wondering, you want to compare that to white people, the equivalent number is 99 men for every 100 women in this age group. Back in 1972, in his book, No Name in the Street, James Baldwin called this one when he wrote, the truth is that this country does not know what to do with the black population now that the blacks are no longer a source of wealth, are no longer to be bought and sold and bred like cattle, and they especially do not know what to do with young black men. It is not at all accidental that the jails and the army and the needle claim so many, but there are still too many for the public's comfort. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Bill, where are you from Florence, who shared that quote with me, Bill Brown. Um, there are so many other ways, none of them accidental, in which black lives have been and are always being extinguished in this country. Police killings of black men and women are just one symptom, and periodically it becomes the most visible symptom of the deeply entrenched and institutionalized racism that sits at the core of the power structure in our country. This racism that is responsible for the extinguishment of black lives is evident in our educational institutions, how neighborhoods and especially ghettos have been constructed using the tool of institutionalized discrimination in, uh, in access to housing and in loans, in our political structures and actions both domestically and internationally as Romina spoke about, um, in the dismantlement of black families and in the persistent fear that black people are forced to endure every day in this country. Racialized structures of privilege and access in the US have enormous impact on the well-being of black lives and are responsible for the excessive extinguishment of those black lives. That extinguishment has an enormous impact on all of our lives by narrowing our voices and our perspectives in our communities. The great civil rights organizer Ella Baker said in 1964, until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mothers' sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Can I finish yeah. and then Absolutely. figure That's this out? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we need to understand the modern forms of race, oppression, and slavery, policing the courts and the prison industrial complex that affect black people in today's society. We need to confront the connection between poverty and racism. We need to question establishment narratives and access our news and analysis from sources beyond the mainstream. We need to work harder together. Um, hard together to get people of color into positions of power in our school systems, in our business community, in the media, in our government, and in all public and private institutions. After I spoke here in 2014, as Lois said, I came under attack by the local police union and others who said that as a public official, I should not critique the police. I said then and I say now, it's my duty to speak about and work against racism in all its manifestations, as it is the duty of the Northampton Police Department to do as well. I'll end my remarks today as I did in 2014 with a, a small quote from a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. We are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. What this means to me is that our community and our nation need to work together to change the structures of our institutions and roots to power so that we can all build an anti-racist society, one in which black lives matter and are not extinguished. Hello, my name is Afro Panther. I'm a prominent member of this community. And this is V. Oh yeah, hi. hi. So, I just wanna say for one, I mean, I don't really care if you like this, but when I speak, I don't want any cheering or clapping from any white people. And for two, putting a 
black people and people of color in power would have been to maybe stop giving your speech and let us speak instead. Because it's our lives. We're being killed. And what are you really doing outside of coming to these vigils? Are you educating yourself every day? Are you holding yourself accountable? When's the last time you checked your privilege? You can't come to these white savior benefits. No white people, just making sure. You can't come to these white savior benefits and then think you're doing your part. And where's the other people of color? Come up here. Yes. <laughs> actions speak louder than words. Again, actions speak louder than words. I have had numerous encounters with the police in this town. And you think that this doesn't happen here in Northampton. We're so liberal, we're so caring, we're so blah, blah, blah. It's not true. We are black people living in here while you guys are coming to these functions. And what are you really doing? Actions speak louder than words. This is not a rally, yay, feel good for ourselves because we stand up for racial justice, but where are you? Where? I heard a few people say, stand up, it's not right, and no, it's not right, and we should stand up, but as blacks, especially black males, you know how hard it is to stand up without getting your ass kicked? Our next speaker is Toussaint Lossier, who's an assistant professor of African American Studies at UMass. He's in the process of uh, completing his uh, co-authored book manuscript entitled Rethinking the American Prison Movement. Real quickly, I want to thank everybody for coming out here. Uh, I'm a recent um, arrival here to the Valley, um, and uh, one of the things that's been on my mind very much over the past week is um, the work that my brothers and sisters in Chicago have been doing, um, uh, not just in the past week, but really over the past um, uh, months uh, since the shooting of Laquan McDonald, um, and particularly the work that uh, activists uh, with Black Lives Matters and a whole host of other organizations, particularly black youth, uh, and particularly black women and femmes have been doing to really put the issue of state violence out on the forefront of the city's agenda. And for those who don't know, Laquan McDonald was a young man who was shot uh, by a police officer 16 times um, several years ago in the midst of a mayoral election. And um, in the process, the normal everyday process that takes place with uh, police-involved shootings, his death was covered up, uh, it was brushed to the side, um, his, um, the city actually sought out his family and offered them uh, a settlement check as a way to remove any liability on behalf of the city. And um, at a moment where an issue um, like the killing of uh, Alton Sterling or uh, Philando Castile uh, could have really riveted people's attention, um, the information related to his death, particularly the dash cam footage, the security footage from the uh, fast food restaurant that was right nearby, um, was, um, was buried. And it was only after activists and journalists um, uh, demanded that the city release it that, that that information has been released. And over the past uh, five days, uh, young people, young black people in particular, have been out in the street um, demanding not just justice for um, Laquan McDonald, but justice for uh, many of the black people who have been killed around the country um, by uh, police officers. And um, one of the things that um, I've heard them say repeatedly is that they're particularly worried about um, the environment and the way that the narrative has been changing around police violence. And particularly in the wake of the shootings that took place in Dallas, how many of them feel like uh, their efforts to organize um, and their activism is increasingly going to come under threat. And uh, I think one of the best representations of this is that after the Dallas shooting, uh, where uh, five police officers were killed, um, there was a pledge that was put forward by a coalition of organizations called the Movement for Black Lives. And that pledge called upon people who have been in support of uh, this, the movement that's been building over the past several years to really state um, clearly and publicly that they, they stand with the movement for um, justice and for human dignity, and particularly the movement that's been fighting against uh, state violence directed against black people, and uh, publicly take a pledge and say, this is something that I'm in support of, right? So far, that pledge has received 27,000 uh, 27, people have uh, signed that pledge, right? Um, at the same time, 
I think the same day uh, that, uh, sorry, the day after Alton Sterling was killed and the same day that Philando Castillo was killed, um, a uh, pledge was put on the website, oh, sorry, a petition was put on the web, uh, White House website that um, called for the White House to denounce Black Lives Matter as a terrorist organization. And I'm sure some of you all, whether or not you listen to like conservative media or uh, Fox News or whatever, have, have kind of heard this, um, this, this, uh, this message to some degree, right? And um, uh, after the Dallas shooting, that petition received um, uh, tens of thousands of signatures to the point where it's received over 100,000 signatures, right? Um, so if you think about 27,000 versus 100,000, this is really just a sort of a demonstration of the amount of public support that has been in favor of not only criticizing, right, or castigating Black Lives Matters, which has been pretty forthright about calling itself uh, a nonviolent organization, a nonviolent network of activists around the country, uh, and demanding that it be considered a terrorist organization, right? Um, and um, if you think about what that means, right, in the United States at this moment in time, if you think about the, um, the, all, the, all the sort of associations that we have connected with the word terrorism, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty, significant, um, it's a pretty significant effort to use the language, right? So we're in a moment where there's an increasing um, uh, effort to condemn the sort of thing that you all are doing right now, right? Which is standing in solidarity with people all around the country who are protesting uh, what's been taking place in terms of these police killings. Um, and for organizers who have been out on the street, for the several hundred people who have been arrested over the past couple days uh, demanding justice in places like Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, and Minneapolis, um, Minnesota, right? And um, that same sort of message has been uh, put out by folks like um, Rudy Giuliani, uh, Rush Limbaugh, um, and it's becoming something that we're all going to need to contend with, at least to the degree that um, this issue, unfortunately, does not seem like it's going away. Somebody earlier mentioned the uh, Malcolm X grassroots uh, report um, and the degree that that report found that these sort of police shootings of black people are taking place every 26 hours, right? Uh, there have been a number of shootings that have been taken, a uh, number of killings that have taken place over the past week that we just don't know about because they weren't recorded on video, right? Because the police report uh, was so significant in terms of marginalizing any testimony and eyewitness accounts. And uh, it's gonna be incumbent upon us to, um, to be able to come out um, for vigils like this, but continue to take more significant action to support people who have been arrested in terms of helping to donate money towards their bail and really figure out what are ways that we can, in our everyday actions, challenge racism, um, demand significant, real, um, robust accountability on the part of police and also start to make the connection between how questions like um, police murder connect to issues like wars abroad, right? How um, uh, the ways in which uh, money is being cut from our schools connects to the ways in which um, so much funding is going into our police department. These are basic, like, everyday issues that we need to start taking um, as, we need to start taking seriously in terms of life and death issues. And this, so, this sort of show of support and solidarity is important. What the um, City Hall did earlier this year in terms of hanging the Black Lives Matter sign is important. But it's like the, um, uh, like uh, my elders almost told me that the sort of lowest form of participation in the democracy is going out to vote, right? That's like the least that you can do. And for many of us, coming out tonight is the least that we can do in terms of really helping to push this movement forward and really fighting back against the backlash that's coming. Our next speaker is Usman Power Green, who lives here in Northampton and is a member of the Education Committee of the David Ruggles Center in Florence. He's currently working with folk there to make Florence's radical history more well known locally and nationally. Work for that. He teaches courses in American history at Clark University. Thank you for coming. My name is Usman Power Green. Um, it's wonderful to, to go after my brother here, Toussaint. 
uh, has a lot of wisdom and knowledge about these things in terms of his scholarship and his work. Um, when the previous people came up, I thought to myself, that's part of our problem. We really struggle with having any sort of different opinions, right? We, we spend a lot of time around people who share our ideas, and when someone says something that disrupts it or does it in a way that makes us feel uncomfortable, a lot of times we push back, we get very upset. Who are they to take the mic, right? Instead of just embracing, hey, we're in a rally, right? We're in the public, right? Since then we're in the public, right? right? So, you know, we must embrace that, right? Even if we disagree, right? Democracy, you're supposed to be able to disagree. Um, and so hopefully we're fostering that by allowing people to participate. Um, they said I had five minutes. I told them I couldn't do anything in five minutes. <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I will actually do that just for the sake of, uh, you know, what we have going on. But real quick, you know, some of us spend a lot of time thinking about these issues. Um, some of us do it professionally. Uh, but one thing about living in Northampton for about 15 years, I know, is there are tremendous resources, right? Some of, I'm preaching to the choir, mostly, a few sorts of people who are here. Um, but what we have to recognize is that the opportunity to end racism, right, to speak out against things that upset us, okay, gun control, right, killing black men, right, others, Right, Sister mentioned trans, you know, people. So all these things are crucial. And what I always take um, for myself is just thinking about individually what I can do in my community. You know, for me, it's you know my church, my kids' school, right? When I'm walking down the block, right? Whatever I can do individually, right? I want to make sure I put that energy in something positive and constructive, um, so it doesn't just become moments of rallies, right? So we can rally, right? We're in solidarity. That's what's up, right? Okay, and as everyone keeps saying, you know, you know, people like myself, others, um, you know, I want to shout Steve Strymer, who's been locking down the history of Florence, the radical history of Florence for a long time, others, right? That's right. So you're a truth committee members, we're about to interview them for that statue in Florence and to learn about the contested, the fight to get that statue. Right, we take it for granted now, but some of us, you know, were there when people didn't want that statue, right? So, you know, now is an opportunity for us in this moment of frustration, whatever it takes to motivate you, right? If it's anger, hey, use it, right? Whatever it takes to motivate you to get involved. Um, you know, we, you know, my wife and I started an event on MLK Day for kids, right? We just got the money, borrowed the spot up there, asked some of the people we know to be involved in the program, collecting money, 150 people come through, right? So it doesn't take much, y'all. You just gotta act, right? So hopefully um, this will get y'all, you know, if it takes you know, this sort of thing to get you, you know, to do anything, that's great. Um, but otherwise, I'm hoping that we'll be able to see the David Ruggles Center, about a year old, the actual physical space finally up, will be a space for learning this history and also for social justice to get together with heads to end racism, to think about its manifestations right here in, in Northampton, in Florence, Hilltowns, wherever we're at, to try to do that. So hopefully y'all will join me and others to make that happen. Yeah? yeah. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Misha Hay, uh, speaking on behalf of Surge, which is Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is a national organization of groups and individuals organizing white people for racial justice uh, through community organizing, mobilizing, and education serves, a uh, surge moves white people to act as part of a multiracial majority for justice with passion and accountability. Western Mass Surge provides a space to build relationships, skills, and political analysis to act for change. There you go. Tasha Pika with me. We're going to keep this short um, to make some room, but um, we do want to say that, you've already said what we do, um, but we want to say that we do mourn the lives of the two black men who were murdered by police last week, Philando Castillo and Alto, Alton Sterling. And I also want to bring into this space, as has already happened, Romina and um, Afro Panther have already said, um, 
We want to bring into the space black women and femmes, black queer people, black trans people, black disabled people who suffer a lot of violence from the state and police brutality and institutional racism every day. And we want to say their names, some of their names, Goddess Diamond, Mercedes Successful, Rekia Boyd, Shante Isaac, Maya Young, Sandra Bland, and so many more. Institutional racism and all social oppression is deadly in many forms. We honor the dead and also the thriving, powerful movement for black lives, which guides our work and to which our country is indebted. Black Lives Matter is asking Surge directly, and they should not have to ask, but they're asking us to engage in bold action now. So please join us. You can find us on Facebook, email us at westernmasssurge at gmail.com. Join us downtown on Saturday at 3 p.m. for a demonstration. Join our working groups. Come to a training on Sunday at 3 p.m. in East Hampton on how to have conversations with white people on race. Join us for tabling and door knocking and come to our next meeting. If you get on our email list, we can send you details. So let's show our community and our global community that we also say Black Lives Matter. Our next speaker <clears throat> is uh, Josie Valentin, who's a city councilor in Holyoke. Uh, Josie is originally from Puerto Rico and has been a strong advocate for the Latino community as well as the LGBT community for many years. In December 2014, Josie proudly participated in the Black Lives Matter protest in Holyoke as an elected official and as a member of the community. She lives in Holyoke with her wife Miriam and their 16-year-old daughter, Natalia. Please welcome Josie. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's a little surreal to be here again. When I was just here, pretty much three weeks ago, speaking to many of you who are here tonight about another tragedy, when we gathered here to honor the victims in Orlando. So I want to start by saying that it's I don't look forward to being on these steps in the sense of we wish we were in a world where we didn't have to stand on these steps and have these conversations. But the reality is that we do. And the first thing that I want to say is that a lot of you who are here tonight were here three weeks ago, and I appreciate that you have come back out for this conversation. But the crowd we have here tonight is not the crowd we had when we honored the victims of Orlando. And I say that because to each and every one of you in the audience and each of us here as speakers, you know, we were asked to speak because we're considered to be agents of change in this community. But the reality is that every single one of you has that same power and that same responsibility. So, as agents of change that each and every one of you are, I give you homework. And the homework is twofold. Number one, if you know folks that were here for the Honoring Victims of Orlando event and are not here tonight, have a conversation with them and ask them why they are not here tonight. Because this is really not about what community does this affect, this does not impact me, that is not something I label myself with. I don't care what the excuse is. The reality is that the common denominator is that they are social injustices and we need to work together towards equity across the board. <laughs> the 
The second part of the homework, because we understand that not everyone can be here, not everyone can come out to the street. Folks have other commitments, they have jobs, they have you know, physical impediments that allow them to be here, and ab absolutely, we respect all of that. So for those who could not physically be here, the second part of your homework is to have a conversation with others, especially folks that continue to say language like all lives matter. Yes. Have the difficult conversations, folks. This is not the time to worry about losing friendships. This is not the time to worry about what are the consequences. Because there are thousands upon thousands of people who can be agents of change day by day. So that is your twofold homework. The other piece that I want to talk about is that even though, obviously, I would prefer not to be here having this conversation if this issue was not very much present in our communities, I do want to take the opportunity to thank fellow elected officials, such as Elisa Klein, your own very city councilor right here in Northampton, for taking a stand and being very much present when the tide tells us, as elected officials, that we should be safe and neutral. I have never been safe and neutral. I'm not about to start now. So two things. Two things about elected officials. Number one, to those of us who go out there and we are visible and we are present, make sure that you communicate your gratitude to these folks. Folks like Elisa, fo folks that are all around these communities, Springfield City Councilors who marched in the Springfield Black Lives Matter march just, just yesterday, who are putting themselves out there in a way where they are saying to others, we are here because this is about the community, and we are here because this is about the importance of saying out loud that black lives matter. So, Number one, please, please, please show your support to those elected officials that are out there being present, taking risks, and doing what's right. And second, to those who are not, hold them accountable. Push them, push them in ways in which they hear clearly from you why it is important that they are a face attached to these initiatives and these conversations that we have in our communities. Make sure that you hold them accountable that if they are not in a position where they are looking to be a part of the solution, that you tell them that when the next election is up, they can find another job, okay? And I can tell you, it is not easy. It is not easy when, when we, as public figures are um, attacked by many folks that don't understand this, many folks that do not see the importance of, of the whole conversation that we're having. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult place to be, but at the same time, it's, it's a point where we know that we are clear with our conscience and we know that we are standing for the right thing and that is what we will continue to do. The other piece that I want to tell you all is that I appreciate all of you being here and being a part of um, this event tonight, but I urge you to do two things. Number one is that you look at surrounding communities like Holyoke and Springfield, and you find ways to get involved there. Yeah. It's absolutely awesome that we can have a peaceful event here that we are not dealing with situations where we have police officers in riot gear at the end of the street, and obviously that's something that we definitely want to value, the fact that we can have this peaceful gathering here. But what I wanna say to all of you is the same way you want to be involved in what happens in Northampton, I urge you to look at ways in which surrounding communities that are mainly communities of color are find ways in which you can get involved and you can also be a part of movements there because it's important to remember that not everyone feels safe coming into specific spaces. And so sometimes we have to go where people feel comfortable. So 
tomorrow, when you go to work, when you are out having a walk, when you're buying a coffee, whatever you're doing, push yourself. Push yourself to continue to be more and more an agent of change. Push yourself to have those difficult conversations that absolutely suck because they take our energy and they take, they, they bring so much pain. But at the end of the day, we have to remember that this is a movement and that it cannot be just a couple of individuals. This has to be a massive, massive pushing so that we can have some results that are definitely evident and present nationwide. Thank you and Black Lives Matter. to the end. Um, I want to say a couple of things, some of which have been said before, but I'll say them hopefully in a different way. <clears throat> uh, last weekend I went to New York and uh, when I was on the Amtrak, if ever anybody's been on Amtrak, you see those signs that say, if you see something, say something. And so what I want, when I was sitting there listen, looking at these flashing signs, I thought, now is the time for each of us to really take that to heart. If you see something, if you hear something, even if it's your nice old uncle or the person you work with, and that person is saying something that is racist, take the chance of being unpopular. Take the chance of risking saying something. It's going to be up to us, to each of us, to say something when we hear something, when we see something. We each have to take responsibility. It isn't, you know, just my responsibility or our responsibility because we put this thing on and so it falls on our shoulders. It falls on everybody's shoulders. And so that is what I say to you. If you see something, do something, say something. And start right now, don't wait, start right now. The other thing um, I was thinking is, uh, I read this uh, article the other day, and it was about policing. It was an article by someone named Todd James, and this is what they wrote. What if we had a system of community care and safety organized around the values of dignity, well-being, safety, restoration, and love? What if we thought about the application of care before we thought about the use of force? What if, we, what if care was the central organizing principle for the way we could generate community safety? To create communities of care and safety, we need to move simultaneously to end racialized and gendered, gendered inequality. The anti-black anti-human violence at the heart of our police and military is there to defend and maintain a system of economic inequality. <laughs> Ending violence and inequality must happen together. We need to send the police home and start over. These institutions cannot be incrementally reformed. They need to be disarmed and disbanded. <laughs> community, community needs to take charge of community safety. What do we do when the real solution is clear but seems improbable? We turn to movements and movements which make the impossible possible. And so I say to you, Northamptonites, this is our challenge. We need to start somewhere to building a kind of community that does not rely on police and guns. And so if people are interested in talking about this, I, please contact me, I'll be right here. And I think we, it would, this would be a really positive thing to come out of all of this horror and all of this pain. And this is something that we can do here in Northampton. So thank you for coming, and please talk to me.